This dome made its first public appearance at the 1981 Los Angeles Bicentennial. After that event, the dome was taken apart and put in storage, where it remained for decades, and where it still might be had it not been for Robert Rubin, who acquired it in 2013 and began the process of having it painstakingly restored. It is through Robert's commitment to the preservation of great works of architecture that Crystal Bridges has been able to make this visionary work of Buckminster Fuller available to all of us today. Robert is a former Wall Street commodities and currency trader who, over the course of his 25-year-long career on Wall Street, served on the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's Foreign Exchange Committee and President Clinton's Commission on Capital Budgeting. He has advanced degrees in European history and in the theory and history of architecture from Columbia University. He is a passionate collector with profound knowledge in areas that range from postage stamps to automobiles to contemporary art, design, and of course architecture. Robert is the curator of several film and media exhibitions that include Walker's Hollywood Afterlives in Art and Artifact at the Museum of the Moving Image in New York City, Richard Prince, American Prayer, and Avedon's France Old World New Look at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. In addition, he has written countless essays and books and is co-author of the catalog for the Centre Pompidou's exhibition, Jean Prouvé, Tropical House, a, a, another architectural work that he has restored. So please join me in welcoming Dylan Turk and Robert Rubin to the stage. Thank you. Welcome to Crystal Bridges. This is my second time here, and I love it. Is this working? Okay. Uh, just so you all know, we decided after we were looking at some slides that it was more fun for us to talk about some things. So on the screen, there's going to be just a running series of slides um, that are going to be of the people, places, and ideas that we're going to be talking about tonight. And we'll pause when necessary. Um, we have so much to talk about tonight. Um, your intellectual quests, the global housing crisis, but let's begin with our newest installation outside uh, Buckminster Fuller's Flies Eye Dome. How does it feel seeing it for the first time here? Well, uh, it's very exciting because I've, obviously I've seen it in pieces and I've seen it uh, come together in the uh, yard of the um, fabricator where we restored it. I've seen it set in, um, in a 17th and 18th century city center in France, where it had a very interesting contrast to the stonework of the plaza and the adjacent buildings. I've seen it floating on the water in Amsterdam <laughs> um, as, part of a, as part of a light festival, but I've never seen it in nature. Um, and seeing it in nature is, uh, apart from just being a trip, uh, is also quite instructive because it reminds one that many of Fuller's insights into um, construction come from nature, that there's something very organic about the presence of the dome uh, in these wonderful gardens. And um, I was also very pleased, we had lunch on the lawn today, to watch a stream of visitors um, buzzing around the um, buzzing around the dome, and it was uh, it was really quite heartening to see the interest of the general public in something that's a pretty far out piece of architecture. Yeah, I think the local newspaper said some sort of futuristic spaceship land on the, landed on the lawn, um, but <laughs> we're we're happy we're happy with it. Um, I know we're going to talk about Fuller throughout, and we will a little bit later, um, but would you tell me about first your kind of adventures into modernism, starting really, I think, with the tropical house? Okay, so Jean Prouvé, for those of you who don't know, is 
a French uh, constructor, meaning that he, he designed things and he built things uh, that were building elements. He more or less invented the curtain wall technology in architecture. And like Buckminster Fuller, he was not an architect. I think it's worth, <laughs> I think it's worth noting that two of the people who have had the greatest impact on architecture in the 20th century were not trained architects, uh, as a result of which they were kind of looked down upon during their lifetime by architects. But uh, in the fullness of time, their importance has come to be seen. And Jean Prouvé was um, someone who, who paid for his experiments in architecture by designing and selling furniture to schools and office buildings and factories. And that furniture has become quite fashionable and expensive because um, <laughs> collectors of contemporary art put it under their Basquiat painting <laughs> and it looks great. But so Prouvé is a very sought after name today, but he's not really, he hasn't really been recognized for his, his uh, what, almost political engagement with the idea of emergency housing and low cost housing. Um, he built quite a bit of uh, housing for uh, the homeless of the north of France after the Second World War. And he pioneered uh, a lot of thinking about how to, how to shelter uh, people in distress. At one point, he constructed, he, he, he designed a building system for structures for tropical climates, and he sent three prototypes to Africa. One of these prototypes I brought back from Africa, restored and rebuilt, um, and took it on the road, as we say, <laughs> uh, to uh, Yale University and UCLA before um, giving it to the Pompidou, where it has been displayed. Outside at the Pompidou, it has been displayed in Nancy. And this idea of industrialized housing is uh, an idea that has challenged architects for um, most of the post-war period, which is how do you apply the uh, economies of scale of industry to the making of homes. It's not as easy as it, uh, as it sounds, but the, the excitement of uh, taking the house out of Africa, figuring out how to put it back together, figuring out what to do with it um, was really one of the great adventures of my life. And I had the advantage, which is an advantage that is shared by the, by the um, Fly's Eye Dome, of having a non-site specific prototype so that what's interesting is that the, the building system itself is more interesting than any single iteration of the building. So with the tropical house, I got to play with, I made a square one, made a rectangular one, uh, at Yale, we put it inside in section, which means we built you know half the house so that you could see it um, essentially sliced in half. And that led me to acquire the Maison de Verre in Paris, um, the glass house, although in America the glass house means the Philip Johnson house. Uh, <laughs> Mine came first, <laughs> and we refer we refer to the Philip Johnson house as that other glass house. <laughs> but um, so at that point, between the the tropical house and uh, Charo's house, I started getting a lot of phone calls from uh, people advancing modernist structures in distress, one way or another. Um, as I'm sure Alice will tell you, she must get a lot of calls now that the Frank Lloyd Wright House and the Buckminster Fuller House are up about people who have this house that's in danger, this structure that's about to be torn down, 
this house that needs a good home. Because <clears throat> modernism, which is um, a very important movement of the 20th century, and which has um, local significance as well through the work of, of Faye Jones, um, is something that hasn't really been thought of in terms of preservation uh, until very recently. There was a major Pierre Chirot house in America that was designed for the painter Robert Motherwell that was torn down in 1985, and there wasn't a peep out of anybody. So, you know, in, in the 30 or so years since then, we, we've, we've come away, but um, so when the Buckminster Fuller Institute decided to, to sell uh, or to find a white knight for the largest of the flies I dome, I was among the usual suspects. And of course, I couldn't say no. I didn't really know what I was going to do with it, but I knew that I had to do it. So um, Earlier when we were talking, you mentioned that you don't just take on a project. You think about what is the end goal. Right. You said something like, you know, you don't look at the outside and go, oh, okay, we can match the historic paint color. You have to right. know the end right. result. Yeah, I think that that, that, that that raises an interesting point, which is what do you do with these things, you know? I mean, it's like right now they're um, redoing the famous uh, Sarin and TWA terminal. Mm -hmm and they're turning it into a hotel, right? So that's one kind of adaptive reuse. Um, what what the, the point that, that Dylan was, was reminding me of is that there's no such thing as the right restoration, that the, the, the idea of taking on a project like this requires you to make certain political kinds of choices that yes, there is a scientific answer as to what color a Corbusier house was painted in the 1920s, even though for decades we thought they were all white, we now know that that's just because black and white photography didn't bring out right. the colors and they were all colored. But that's the least of it because, you know, if you're into picking the paint colors, you've already gone very far. So, for example, when my wife and I bought the Maison de Verre, we r agreed that we would live in the house. That we, the fact that this house was a residence, a doctor's office, and a, and a cult place of cultural gathering for its original owners meant that even though I'm not a medical doctor, which has been a big disappointment to my mother her whole life, um, <laughs> <laughs> that we would make the house um, live in a way that the, that the architect and the original owners intended it to. So we have left the downstairs medical offices the way they are. We live in the house. We have uh, cultural events in the house. We're right next door to a, a, a major university in Paris. They use the house for, for colloquia. Um, we could have turned the house into a museum. We could have turned the house into an art gallery. Uh, we could have said no thank you and they could have sold the house to Bernard Arnault or Francois Pinault or some other uh, owner of a luxury goods conglomerate who would have made it a corporate headquarters. We could have sold it. Well, in the, in the case of the Maison de Verre, it was protected by uh, landmark laws that ruled out a whole class of potential buyers who would buy the house and then add another five or 10,000 square feet to it, which is what sometimes happens to these modernist houses in Palm Springs or, mm -hmm. uh, or Los Angeles. So you have to make a choice. And um, the choice with the Maison de Verre was to occupy the Maison de Verre and to demonstrate that you could live comfortably in the 21st century in a modernist house from the 20th century, which, which had, and many of these houses have a bad rap as being cold and unlivable and no fun 
and too small, and the bathrooms are too small, and whatever, and, and none of that is true, I can assure you. The Maison de Verre is a delightful place to live. Now, the tropical house and the Fly's Eye Dome, which share many similarities, are, are different projects because at the end of the day, for me, both of them are pedagogic objects. And what is the object of this pedagogy? The object of this pedagogy is to remind people of what modernism started out to be and which has kind of lost its way. Um, it's not just a decorative style. Right. Modernism today is kind of degenerated into a decorative style or a kind of ornament um, where, you know, concrete and glass is, is, is an ornamental or a superficial um, style, but a 20,000 square foot house with nine bathrooms is not a modernist house. It <laughs> might look like a modernist house, but it's, it's detached from all, I mean, modernism came about as a way of bringing ergonomics, hygiene, and mass housing, issues of, of, of mass housing into architecture, which hadn't been there before. So Jean Prouvé and Buckminster Fuller are two of my heroes, and these projects are ways of explaining to people what these two men represent in terms of the built environment going into the 21st century. And both of these non-architects were politically engaged and environmentally engaged in ways that many architects today are not. And in fact, I believe that 50 years from now, Buckminster Fuller will be seen as one of the great architectural visionaries of the 20th century and maybe even the first eco-architect when he asked the question, how much does your building weigh? I think he opened up the floodgates for a kind of uh, <clears throat> understanding of the limits of the planet's resources and where, where we find ourselves today with the refugee crisis, which itself is a proxy for future um, population crises that we will experience as a result of the uh, impacts of global warming. Jean Prouvé is part of this group because he, the formative experience of his life was living through World War II and refusing to turn his factory over to the Germans, uh, refusing to collaborate. They took the factory and Jean Prouvé spent the war basically making stuff with his hands, bicycles, coal stoves, things like that, and this profoundly marked his output after the, um, the war in the sense of how you make the most out of the least. And this, these are points of view that need to be brought back into architecture today and need to be the inspiration for architecture students today because they're, th these are the people that are gonna save us, not, not people <laughs> my age who are you know, already uh, toward the end of a, of a career. So you, know, you, you see these architectural structures and um, you know, when you've talked a lot about the kind of innovative elements of these. Um, what do you see as your role as someone who collects a diverse type of type of object and really studies it? I mean, earlier you were describing to me that you're not interested in collecting to accumulate. You're interested in collecting right. because you love the process of learning it. And well, right. I think that that there's there's two kinds of collecting. There's collecting what I would call checklist collecting. So, for example, when I was little, I collected baseball cards. And you know you could have uh, all the baseball cards the Topps Bubblegum produced in one year, and that was a finite goal, and you could get to the end of that goal. And then if you wanted to be more ambitious, you could say, I want complete sets of the New York Yankees for all the years they won the World Series. So you can, you know, but those are still finite goals. And then I got into broader realms where <clears throat> there was no goal. There was just a process, and the process is one of bringing objects together that 
where you create connections that are illuminating to people. So, you know, I don't think there was anybody out there who thought that putting Jean Prouvé and Buckminster Fuller um, together uh, was an obvious connection. Um, and even with Pierre Chereau, Buckminster Fuller can be connected to Pierre Chereau in, in unexpected ways, even though Pierre Chereau superficially is associated with this fancy house in Paris. Um, he was collaborating with Fuller's agent in France, and there, there are all these, these connections. So the idea, I, I like to put things together that create meanings that weren't necessarily evident in the, uh, in the first place. And the other thing is that one of the sayings that I try to live by is that um, there are no trailer hitches on coffins, right? So <laughs> you, you can't take any of this stuff with you. So it's, it's very important to make sure that even though there's the, the, the thrill of the chase, I can assure you that getting this house out of Africa was fun, just like getting old race cars out of Australia and Brazil and those places was fun before that, but there needs to be an end game. And so the, you know, for the Maison de Verre, how do my wife and I ensure that it doesn't become a museum or become adaptively reused as a, you know, as a, like a, a, a small hotel or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, you know, I'm kind of, I understand that there's really no alternative for the TWA terminal, but to turn it into some kind of a hotel slash party space, but there's <laughs> something, there's something kind of depressing about that. At the that, airport? Yes, yeah. at the airport, right. Yeah. So, you know, how, how do I assure that the Maison de Verre is ship-shaped for the next hundred years uh, before I turn it over to some kind of an institution that will not uh, give in to the pressure to have a gift shop and put exit signs, but will keep it as a home at the same time, not necessarily a single person's home or a single family's home, but a place that can be visited as a home. And along those lines, I think the, um, the dome ending up here is an extremely satisfying outcome to me um, because, first of all, it's connected to an architecture school and an important American architecture school. Um, second of all, it's connected to a museum that has as its bigger goal to advocate for American art to a Midwestern audience, um, which it's succeeded at spectacularly so far for the first, uh, I guess, six years of mm -hmm. its existence. I mean, I have a lot of experience on both coasts with, uh, with museums, and each museum has an agenda, going back to my comment before, and I think that the agenda of Crystal Bridges dovetails very nicely with my own agenda with respect to Buckminster Fuller in particular and American architecture in general. So you've, you, two of your projects, the Fuller Dome is now at a museum, you gifted the tropical house to Centre Pompidou. Okay. Um, what do you think a museum's role is in continuing this and advancing innovation in architecture and telling these stories that you've spent so much of your life uh, pulling out? Well, I think that, that one of the things that's hit me on this visit is what a great platform this museum is to raise issues of architecture with people who might be coming here because they want to see uh, Dale Chihuly or mm -hmm. they, they, they want to see Norman Rockwell or they want to see uh, Stuart Davis, that suddenly there's this amazing Frank Lloyd Wright uh, um, relocation, and there's also this otherworldly 
flies eye dome out there. <laughs> By the way, I want to say that the, the Frank Lloyd Wright house is kind of halfway between the dome and the tropical house, which are not site specific at all, and the Maison de Verre, which is totally site specific because for, for those of you who don't know the history, it's a 20th century insertion in a courtyard of 18th century buildings, and the original intention was to tear down one of those 18th century buildings, but in France, where the rules were very favorable toward tenants, they couldn't get the old lady upstairs out, so they ended up having to leave the top floor of the building and knock out the rest of the building, put in the girders, and instead of being able to make a house from scratch, they could only make this box. So, I mean, aside from the fact that you can't move it, you wouldn't want to move it because its whole meaning is about how modernity lives with tradition. I mean, one of the conceits of modernism, which we've managed to get rid of, is that it's, it's out with the old and in with the new, and that you, know, you tear down everything and you build from scratch, and we've understood that nothing really works that way. And the, muse and, and the Maison de Verre is a perfect example of modernism making its peace with the pre-existing urban fabric. So you can't touch the Maison de Verre. Even if there were no rules, you wouldn't want to touch it. The Frank Lloyd Wright House, Crystal Bridges recognized that yes, it was built at a specific place. It's not a modular building system. It's a, it's a housing system, but it's not completely modular. Um, but the house could be moved to another site, which would be at least as appropriate as its original site. And in fact, in some ways, <clears throat> Crystal Bridges has improved on the siting of the house relative to its original site because it's in a much more spectacular place now. So moving the right house here um, was to me an authentic gesture within the realm of possibilities, that the choice was either tear the house down or move it to a, to a, a sympathetic site. So I'm very happy to see it here. And I also was, was thinking, I was struck by watching the people react to it, that we live in a time where the American dream of owning your own house is under considerable pressure. And I think that people see the right house, they understand this element of, of our American dream and um, see how great architects have thought about delivering that to large numbers of people because the, the right house is, is basically middle, very middle class housing, but it's a beautiful jeweled object compared to the junk that gets built yeah. today. So that brings me to my next question, right. very lovely. Right. Um, so, you know, we're talking about these great innovators, and most of them were building a, a while ago, uh, all of the properties we were talking about. So we're now in this kind of global housing crisis, and we've talked about this. Here in our backyard, European refugees, devastation in Puerto Rico. Um, why do you think this is happening, and can it be resolved? Well, I think, it's, I think it's happening because the carbon economy and the ways in which the carbon economy has developed in terms of suburban sprawl and, 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 and global warming and everything else is coming back to, to haunt us. I think that we ha we've gone from the 20th century issue of dealing with the, the displacements of a depression and two world wars to dealing with even more extreme displacements of ever greater numbers of people. The, we've moved from a period after the Second World War where there, we, we were able to think about middle class housing and where we had large scale developers like Levittown and then we had enlightened developers like Eichler in Los Angeles. But I think now we're beyond that and we're 
at a stage where the architectural profession needs to recognize that we are in a crisis situation. I mean, we have it in Puerto Rico. I mean, Puerto Rico has yeah. to basically be rebuilt from scratch. And, um, and so architects don't have the luxury of thinking about, you know, two cars in every garage and a chicken in every mm -hmm. pot. It's a more basic uh, elemental uh, survival uh, situation. I have another question, which is to ask you to talk about Teddy Cruz a little bit. <clears throat> Before everybody jumps out of their chair, I'm not talking about the senator from uh, Texas. <laughs> Teddy Cruz, Teddy Cruz is an extremely interesting uh, radical architect practicing out of San Diego and Tijuana. He's a professor at um, the University of California at San Diego. And um, he's done work in Latin America, which is really where most of the innovative urban planning in the world has taken place. I mean, many of you know uh, that Medellin was a mess uh, as a result of the, uh, I mean, anybody who's watched Narcos on Netflix knows <laughs> all about the, the Medellin cartel and everything else. But the mayor of Medellin has undertaken a number of bottom-up initiatives, and now Medellin is one of the most interesting growth cities um, in the world. But Teddy is part of that vanguard of out-of-the-box Thinking and he does a lot of work in um, in the informal settlements of Tijuana, which come right up against the wall and uh, the border wall. The border wall, right? And I met Teddy a few years ago, and we became friendly. And in in the small world department, I happened to be. I, I happen to have in a container still in France, well now it's in San Diego, um, all of the bits and pieces of the tropical house that I didn't use. Um, for example, there were panels that were, dr that were drilled, that were cut up so that air conditioners could be pushed into the house and stuff like that and we didn't use that and, and I'd been, forgot about this stuff for 15 years. And then Teddy called me to say that he was working on a building system with a shelving manufacturer called Mechalux. And maybe you've seen their shelves around. They do industrial shelving. But he, they have a factory in Tijuana. So Tijuana is full of these maquiadoras, they're called, which are factories that are making products that are then being exported uh, to California <coughs> and Texas. And he had been working with Mechalux to convert their shelving systems to be structural systems that would be used as the basis for these informal settlements. Teddy is working in one settlement that's right up against the border wall um, that has a population of 85,000 people and is not in any way a formal city. And what he does is he brings these Mechalux structures and people make houses out of the teardowns from San Diego because when a house in San Diego is knocked down and, and rebuilt, all of the walls and, and materials go across the border and people in Mexico use that stuff to build houses. So when he was explaining this to me, I, I said, what a perfect way to bring attention to your project is to take all the rest of the tropical house and build a, a headquarters for the Mechalux project uh, and call it Prouvé at the border. Because right now what's happening is that all of these Prouvé structures are being turned into artworks by wealthy art collectors, or in the case of Asian wealthy art collectors, tea houses. I kid you not, these are houses that were built, Prouvé built like 500 of these houses in, in Nancy after the war, and these houses are now being sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars. These are like old emergency houses, um, and people are, are commissioning architects to design bathrooms and kitchens to add to them, and in some cases, they're being made into tea houses and garden follies, and it's kind of bothering me 
because we're losing sight of, of the reason that Prouvé is, is, is worth paying attention to in the first place. So Teddy and I are, are developing this project. Um, we just started, the container arrived in San Diego last month, and I'm going down in November to see what he, what he has in mind. But I think that these are the kind of, and, and Teddy's, Teddy is a trained architect, but he doesn't spend a lot of time making drawings. He spends a lot of time advocating for uh, the people who are the beneficiaries of the Machiadoras to give back to the other side of the border some, uh, you know, the materials and the know-how and to also empower the people who live in these settlements to make their own houses. You know, one of the things we've always seen in these grand modernist schemes like Chandigarh in India or Brasilia in Brazil is that as soon as the people get in there, they customize the houses according to their own traditions mm -hmm. and habits, which is as it should be. So why not just give them the basics, the, the, the raw materials, to make their own residence so they have an ownership and a, and a sense of authorship as well. So I, to me, Teddy Cruz represents the future of architecture because he spends as much time with the mayor of San Diego um, as he does on the other side of the border um, helping people build their houses. He's, a, he's, he's a, an architect needs to be a mediator. He needs to be an urban planner, a designer, and a political advocate who has a command of zoning regulations, of cross-border economic flows. Um, you know, the idea that an architect, an architect designs structures on a piece of paper and then he hands them to an engineer and the engineer certifies the loads and then he hands a piece of paper to a builder and the builder builds it according to spec, I mean, that's, that's old school. You know, we, we have to come up with different approaches that are more integrated. So, you know, my next project is really working with Teddy to try to get some attention for these, these prefabricated systems, which can be significantly less expensive and more effective than, um, than what mass builders turn out now. One last question. Okay. You mentioned it a little bit earlier. We kind of live in a world of snark uh, of Star -architect. star architects. There's I also said snark snark architect. I know. Snark is different. <laughs> I like them actually. I like that too. Um, <laughs> but uh, star architects, um, and we've been talking a lot, and I think Teddy's a great example. Are star architects where we're going to find radical innovation that's going to move us forward? And if not, where does that exist? Or, or, are people out there with the answers? Well, I would compare Starkitects to the great, the, the famous salon painters of the 19th century in the sense that a Starkitect is someone who has mastered the system. And not only does he make beautiful drawings that result in buildings that make developers and towns want to, uh, hire them, I mean, the classic example of that is the Bilbao effect, you know, that everybody wants a Frank Gehry building on which to build a civic dream. I mean, I think Frank Gehry's a great architect. Some of his buildings don't always work as well as, as, as they might, but I think that he's done a lot to bring computer design and the discipline of the aeronautics industry into the practice of architecture, but when I say they're like the great salon painters, meaning that they're the ones that everybody's buying in the 19th century, and Frank Gehry and Zaha Hadid and, and people like that are the architects that everybody's buying in the 20th century, and they've made contributions, but the people that really changed painting were the people who couldn't get into the salons, the people who the people like uh, Monet and Manet and the, and the painters that we recognize as the radicals of, of their time, they were at the margins of polite artistic society in the 19th century, 
And the people who change architecture are people who are at the margins of polite society. And again, I mean, Teddy Cruz is a trained architect, but you know, he doesn't have an office with 30 people at building office buildings. He's chosen to operate in a, in a different structure. So he has uh, field offices in the various places in Mexico where he's learning about what's going on in, in informal settlements. He doesn't have an architectural office. And I think that uh, we're going to find the people who change architecture outside the architectural profession. They'll be entrepreneurs. I mean, this is a great thing about America. It's a country that encourages entrepreneurs. Jean Prouve, Bucky Fuller went bankrupt a couple times, <laughs> and he came back for more. That's what makes this country great. Jean Prouvé went bankrupt once, and he was marked for, for life. I always believed that if Jean Prouvé had gotten on a boat and come to America, he would have found backers for all of his visions instead of being consigned to the, to the dust heap like he was. I mean, Bucky Fuller was, was peddling new ideas right up until the, uh, the time he died, yeah. you know? That's what, uh, that's what makes our country great. So, but, you know, they'll, th these people will come out of, uh, they may be architects, but they'll be renegade architects. They won't come out of the big architectural offices. Because it's a, you know, it's a very, it's become a very, contemporary architecture has become a very corporate uh, practice. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I, th I see this really, although it's been up for a little bit, as the uh, kind of formal opening and Fly's Dome is here and kind of continuing our narrative so well. Um, and so I really thank you for saving it and giving us the opportunity to make it open to the public. Well, I think, I, just to close on this, on this, with this one comment, I think Crystal Bridges is extraordinarily well positioned to occupy a unique place among museums in America because it has the space and it has the political will, as it were, to do this. And um, so far, you're batting a thousand. And I would say that even if I wasn't the previous owner of the Fly's Eye, <laughs> uh, the Fly's Eye Dome. Uh, and you know, we need this. We, we need places that can teach the American people what architecture is about, yeah. and uh, working in tandem with the with the, the University of Arkansas, I think it's a great it's a great opportunity. Oh, just this yeah, one. I, I have to say, say so can we stop that image yeah. for a second? Megan, would you pause that? Yeah, you can you can do it. Okay, so this is the other fly's eye dome. Twenty four uh, foot. The twenty four foot which was purchased by a real estate developer uh, in Florida. And while he did a very nice job of restoring it, he, he took a different route. He took it to a boat builder, and they did a terrific job on it. It makes me sick to see it here <laughs> because it's being used to sell Prada clothes, and you know, Prada clothes are nice clothes. But I, I hate the idea of these very engaged projects, because Prouvé and Fuller were engaged, socially engaged architects being abstracted into mall decor. I mean, it's a high-end <laughs> mall, but this is mall decor, and it drives me nuts. So that's another reason why I'm so happy the dome is here, where it can be taken seriously. So that's how not <laughs> to, per, to, to preserve modernism. So on that, I'll, I'll end. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here. We are going to be doing a little uh, opening it up for questions, so maybe we could bring the house lights up, and um, if anyone has any questions, Sandy and uh, Moira are around, and just raise your hand. Gary. I'm curious if the, uh, the whole project with Teddy Cruz 
how transferable is that to some place like India or a Mexico City? Just the scale seems overwhelming to be able to address those situations. Well, I, I think that, um, I mean, obviously, what we have coming down the pike in the way of displacement of populations is, is, is terrible to, to think about. But I think that um, something like repurposed Mechalux shelving is <laughs> something that's infinitely replicable, and it's just a question of getting it into the hands of people who can put it up and, and build on it. I mean, we've seen, uh, you know, IKEA has made some very interesting um, emergency housing, which has been deployed in Europe. I think that um, as long as the uh, regulatory environment for this kind of housing is, um, doesn't get out of hand, then uh, anything's possible. One of the problems that prefab has had as a, as a, as a housing mode is that the building codes throughout America are not very friendly to prefab. They're much friendlier to trailers. It's easier, it's easier to take a trailer and put it in a trailer park than it is, and we all know that that's like the lowest common denominator of architecture, um, than it is to build a prefabricated house somewhere because, you know, we run on a real estate model with the uh, building codes. And we don't like to deviate from that. But look, scale is a problem. But the idea is to, is to come up with something that you can put in the hands of the people themselves that they can participate in the build out. You know, there's a, you can only go so far bringing in prefabricated housing and like into a refugee camp and having people live in it, you know, it, that's only temporary. So if this is going to be um, successful, people have to be open to the idea that um, the displaced have to participate in the construction of their own environment. Any other questions? I have a couple of, of okay. and then you could choose what to respond to. I was wondering if the uh, movement to many houses, uh, if you see that as a contributing social conversation, or is that more faddish and only limited? Well, and I think that many, many houses can be considered faddish, but I think many houses are a symptom of uh, the decline of the American dream of home ownership, and that um, I think that many houses are a less desperate version of what's going on with older people in America now who are, there's this very interesting book, I, I can't remember the title, but a woman who spent a year going to places uh, where senior citizens who would normally be retired are living on the road and working at places like Amazon warehouses and living out of their cars or out of small trailers. Um, it's just, it, it's kind of a, the genteel end of that is mini houses. But look, anything where somebody recognizes that they don't really need so much square footage to live and be happy, I'm, I'm in favor of. But, uh, you know, again, a mini house, we're not zoned for mini houses. I mean, yeah. if you drive in to a place and it's two acre zoning and you can't drop them, you know, that's a, that's a big piece of property to buy to put a mini house on. The zoning <laughs> has to be adjusted to allow for these smaller houses. But it, it's fascinating to see people adjusting to the new real estate realities and whether it's, you know, living in your car or living in a mini house or whatever, it's, it's happening and it's, it's, it, 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 it's widespread. Any other questions? 
There's one right here. So I, I have sort of a, a technical question. Uh, my wife and I just visited the, the, uh, this structure, and we noticed in the picture that the last time it was constructed in L.A., there seemed to be lenses. Oh, right, right. Well, obviously, in, and in this particular case, they, they created their own lens. When Fuller built it in order to make it visitable in Los Angeles, they constructed these lens, these plastic lenses, which weren't very uh, elegant or useful, and which, with time, are basically all yellow and cracked. And we made the decision not to put lenses on it because uh, that was kind of a retrofit, and not you know it, it's like. Um, when the, when the tropical house went to Africa, I think the day before they sent it down, somebody said, hey, we didn't put any locks on the doors. And they ran over to the <laughs> hardware store and bought a bunch of locks and slapped them on. And I don't consider that prouvé, right? That's, that's something that was done at the last minute to, uh, to, to, to be able to use the structure. I think that one of the very interesting exercises that the architecture school could go through is to consider what kind of membranes using today's technology could be used to uh, cover the uh, fly's eyes and in terms of letting light in, letting heat out or in. Uh, it would be interesting to see how the technology uh, of today would adapt in the same way that you would want to think about what kind of materials could be used in a fly's eye dome today, which, you know, the, stru the structural idea of the fly's eye dome remains the same, but fiberglass is kind of an antiquated uh, material to use now in this day of carbon fiber and, and everything else, just like the aluminum of the tropical house is like, you know, forget it today, you wouldn't use that, you would use something much lighter. So, you know, again, it's a pedagogic object. We've, we've, we've presented here what Fuller and Foster, the best of their thinking up to the time, and now it's up to new people to think about how, uh, how to make it even lighter and more environmentally responsive, but to, to fabricate this. I mean, somebody could come up with the idea of making these in China. You know, I'm sure you could make thousands of these very cheaply in China using new materials, and, and then now you have a new kind of, uh, of house. But, you know, we haven't, we haven't done that yet. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Thanks for being here, Bob. It was a pleasure. <laughs>